I'm Enrique Cerna. Next on Conversations, the kidnapping of New York Times correspondent David Rode by the Taliban. The Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and his wife, Kristen Mulvihill, detail his ordeal and her struggle to save him in their book, A Rope and a Prayer, a kidnapping from two sides. David Rode and Kristen Mulvihill tell their story next on Conversations. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you. David Rode and Kristen Mulvihill, thank you very much for joining us here on Conversations. A Rope and a Prayer in this book, uh, you guys really, you alternate the chapters in telling of your kidnap and how you're handling all of the uh, ordeal as it goes along. I got to wonder, how long have the two of you been together as a couple? We've been together four years. Yep. We've been married, married just over two. two. You knew what he did for a living. I did. Yeah. And uh, you you work in the fashion world and yes. fashion yes. photography and uh, has yeah. wor have worked for Cosmo other mm -hmm. other women's magazines, mm -hmm. two different worlds. Yes. But you knew that what he did was a bit dangerous at times. Mm -hmm. Did you guys talk about? But you'd already been in prison once when you right. were by by the Bosnian Serbs mm -hmm. back in 1995. Mm -hmm. So what was that conversation like? Um, we had actually we weren't together at that point, but we right. had talked about you know what to do if he was injured or God forbid if he died. Um, we didn't really talk specifically about kidnapping. Um, I think it was probably a topic we maybe wanted to avoid because we didn't think it would ever happen. It, 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 he'd been detained once, and what are the odds of that happening again? Um, so no. But the situation does happen. Uh, yes. You're working on a book in Afghanistan. Uh, give me the particulars mm -hmm. about how this comes about. Um, I had covered Afghanistan since 2001, was really kind of passionate about seeing what had happened there. I really saw it as sort of a tragedy. There was real sort of hope among Afghans um, when the Taliban fell. And so I wanted this to be the best book possible. The Taliban had this huge resurgence, and so I decided I needed to interview a Taliban commander to make the book as strong as possible. And um, many other journalists have done it. Dozens of journalists have successfully interviewed the Taliban. So I found this commander who had done interviews with two uh, European journalists. Um, he had not kidnapped them, though I thought it would be safe. I talked with one of those journalists. They said, you're in more danger as an American, but you should be okay. And unfortunately, we were, we were all wrong. It was a trap. And he, uh, we drove to this interview, and he, he abducted us. Had you made any promises to her about not putting yourself in danger before you did this? Um, I had told her I would try to minimize the risk. I had told my family since this this thing in Bosnia, and it was a you know I I did not tell her I was going to go do this interview. It's something I'll always regret. It was a sort of terrible decision on my part. I had done all this research, knew the guy, um, talked to these other journalists. I, I thought it would be safe. I, you know, was trying to spare her worry, um, and I, you know, will always regret that decision not not telling her. Bosnia, explain that very briefly. Um, I was covering the war in Bosnia for the Christian Science Monitor, and there was rumors of mass executions um, that Bosnian Serb forces had killed um, thousands of Bosnian Muslims. And I went in and found these mass graves uh, right where survivors said they would be. And I was at a second mass grave site, and I was actually arrested by Bosnian Serbs and they held me for 10 days and then released me. So that had been very difficult for my family. And honestly, for the next 13 years, I had been relatively cautious. Um, and, and part of what happened here was I kind of let competition get the best of me. Uh, again, all, it seemed as all these other journalists had done the interviews, um, and I, you know, I just I, I lost my way, is what I say in the book. And, and but I this was going to be really your last... Uh, war zone. I, yes, the, the part of the desire to make the book as strong as possible was to try to get out of this kind of war zone reporting to write the definitive book on Afghanistan since 2001. Um, we had been married two months earlier, mm -hmm. and the hope mm -hmm. was that you know the book would allow me to kind of move to more stable forms of reporting, and more importantly, a more stable life with my new <laughs> wife. Did you worry about him when he was in Afghanistan leading up to this? I, I did. I mean, he had had several trips to Afghanistan, several to Pakistan to cover the elections after Budo's assassination. Um, so I always worried, you know, and, and, but when this happened, this was like having my worst fear come true. Yeah. So take me there, November 10th, 
2008. And tell me, leading up to this, and how it all transpired. Um, we um, had a meeting point that we had set with this commander. We left early in the morning. It was myself and an Afghan journalist, Tahir Ladin, and an Afghan driver, Assad Mangal. Uh, we reached the meeting point, no problem. It was just outside of Kabul on a paved road near a U.S. military base. And the commander said we had to go a little bit farther down the road. Uh, we did that, and we went a few hundred yards, and a car was blocking the road in front of us. Um, two men rushed towards our car. They each have rifles. They ordered the driver out of the driver's seat and into the back seat with me, and they ordered the Afghan journalist out of the passenger seat into the back seat with me, and then they took over the car themselves. A second car appeared, and we were driven off into the desert, and it happened in, you know, maybe 30 seconds a minute, and that was the beginning of seven months in captivity. How soon after uh, you were kidnapped uh, did you get to know a bit about who it was that kidnapped you and where they were coming from and what they wanted? It was very confusing because um, the person who invited us to the interview abducted us, but he um, put a scarf over his face and pretended he was someone else for the first, you know, several weeks of the captivity. Um, what happened was they quickly moved us out of Afghanistan into Pakistan, and we were taken um, into the tribal areas of Pakistan, which was a very bad sign. And we were taken to an area that's controlled by a faction of the Taliban known as the Haqqani Network. It's the Haqqani family that runs the area. And uh, I met uh, one of the leaders um, uh, from the family, and they let me call mm -hmm. Kristen mm -hmm. nine days into the kidnapping. Um, so it was all, frankly, really bad news. Um, we were taken to this mini-state, the Taliban control. There was no pressure on them. American troops cannot carry out raids inside Pakistan. And, you know, they were very confident and... It was, you know, a very difficult situation. How soon after he had been kidnapped did you find out what had happened? Uh, it was probably about 12 hours later, and I was at work. I just started the job at Cosmopolitan, so that was quite a contrast. Yeah. I was dealing with bachelors in their boxer shorts, <laughs> and, and then I get a call from his brother, his brother Lee, who worked with me throughout, um, you know, stating that David didn't come back from his last interview. Uh, you know, initially, as I said, it was like my worst fear come true. I felt numb in the initial moments and then was quickly thrust into to dealing with the FBI, New York Times, um, private security contractors. Yeah, it was Be before you left and were kidnapped, you'd actually written her uh, mm -hmm. a, a mm -hmm. short note. What did it say? I did. It was a note, frankly, I yeah. hope she'd never read. It was yeah. kind of a worst-case scenario note. It said, you know, um, you know, I feel I have to do this for the book. I, I think it will be okay. Um, you know, if, if things go wrong, you know, use money from this book advance. Don't mm -hmm. use any of mm -hmm. your own money. And... You know, and, and honestly, if, if thanking her for all, you know, the joy she'd given me and telling her that if things went, you know, absolutely wrong, mm -hmm. to sort of move on in life. But it was, it was, um, it's all of this was sort of not my finest hour, and, um, you know, I'm just elated to be home. And, but I also think there was a real shift. He hadn't been back to Afghanistan in about six months. You know, we, we were getting married, we went on our honeymoon. And I think during that time, there was a shift in the ground of, of reporters being able to just rely on sort of local um, local camaraderie and whatnot, and I think that had changed when he went back and, and maybe misjudged it. But a as you're going through all of this and you read this note, mm -hmm, once, once mm -hmm. you finally get it, mm -hmm. um, tell me about your emotions. My, I felt everything in those initial mo moments. Um, Were you hacked at him a bit? I was, I was upset about the note, and I was a little angry. He hadn't told me he'd gone to the interview, but I quickly realized, you know, um, it wasn't his fault. They kidnapped him. The Taliban kidnapped him. And in the end, I do think he suffered more than anybody else. He lived with a daily threat of, of being decapitated. Um, I spoke to my mom about it. I went to see her fairly early on in the case, and I said, you know, I'm not quite comforted by this note. I just took a vow. And her response was, you know, you both took a vow, and now's your chance to live up to it. Don't be angry. Just concentrate on bringing him home. Um, and I think, you know, those initial moments of feeling angry is almost like he had something to do with the kidnapping, which he didn't. Yeah. Um, and I think that was a way of my mind almost protecting me against the reality that he was not going to be in control. Let's go back to you being held in captivity now and tell me about life. Uh, I, I, I take it every day you just didn't know what was going to happen, what was going to go on. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a weird thing because you're essentially bored. We were we were held in this house with a big mud brick wall around it, um, and it was very you know it would range from sort of terrifying to just tedium. And um, I spent a lot of time talking to my guards, and what was really disturbing was sort of they had all been brainwashed into thinking that this was all a religious war, that the 9/11 attacks had been staged. They had been told that U.S. troops were forcibly converting 
Afghan Muslims to Christianity, that um, Afghan women were being forced to work as prostitutes on U.S. military bases, and they really lived in this kind of alternate universe. Could you argue with them at all, or do you dare not? I pretty much dared not. I tried in the beginning, and it just got me nowhere. Uh, they were, you know, they very much saw themselves as sort of defending their faith and their culture from this kind of foreign assault. Um, it was really stark what exists there. What did you learn about them, I, I guess, about their educational background, their age, uh, you know, what had happened to them to reach this uh, kind of very black and white feeling about America and, and the Western world? They, they really knew very little about the world outside of Afghanistan and Pakistan. They, most of them had elementary school, maybe junior high educations. There was one young man I lived with who was, he was actually a Pakistani, but he was being trained to be a suicide bomber. Um, he had been told that all Westerners were sort of greedy um, hedonists who just wanted to enjoy the pleasures of this world. And I asked him, you know, do you really want to die? Won't you, when you carry out your suicide bombing, will you miss your parents and your siblings? And he said, the only relationship that matters to me is my relationship with God. And the only world that matters is the next world. And it was fascinating to kind of see up close how breaking the kind of emotional and psychological links between these young men and their families is such a key part of that process. Um, he was sort of fascinated by me, you know, uh, my family's Christian, but I'm not that religious. Um, he asked me, he had been told that all Christians wanted to live for a thousand years because they love this world so much. And he thought that uh, uh, the necktie was sort of a secret symbol of Christianity. Really? And on the other end, yes. as you're living your life daily, mm -hmm. um, how are you managing that? Because mm -hmm. on one hand, yeah. You're still working because you yes, have to exactly. pay the rent. Exactly. And, and I imagine the types of things you're working with at Cosmo, particularly yep. in fashion and all of that, yep. and then you, the serious side of the yeah. reality of your husband's life and death. Now, initially going to work gave me a sense of, of normalcy. Um, it gave me a sense of just comic relief at times. But I will say as a photography director and producer, I'm used to managing personalities, large budgets, um, you know, catastrophizing, um, you know, working with deadlines and whatnot. So that, that helped in, in the kidnapping. Um, but it was, it was really, you know, I'd go to work in the morning, I'd go in late because there'd be security updates in the morning. Occasionally I'd be called out by the FBI if a video communication had arrived. Um, I'd be dealing with celebrity shoots and getting the right car to take them to the shoot, finding the right location. So it was just such a real, um, a real dichotomy, you know. I found it funny that one of the lines you said is since you were working on something about boxers and briefs, yeah. that you're wondering if the Taliban wore boxers or briefs. I know, I know. <laughs> and throughout, I will say that humor, um, you wouldn't think there'd be humor in a situation like this, but finding the moments of absurdity and, and, and comic relief kind of kept me going. Um, if I wasn't laughing, I probably would have been crying. One of the things that you had to deal with in this is whether mm -hmm. to make this very public because yes. it, it, on yep. one hand, it had worked for some people to mm -hmm. have it be made public, right. but on the other right. hand, for others, it had not. Right, and in this instance, he was being held by extremists. It wasn't a legitimate government. Um, so the family felt very strongly we wanted it to be kept private. We didn't want him to be used um, you know, to, to appear on television, pleading to the U.S. government. Um, we just thought that would be disastrous. There had been a little bit of a precedent. There were um, several reporters kidnapped before David, um, and their cases were not made public. Um, so we felt there was a precedent for it. You know, the Times was fantastic in honoring our family's wishes. It went against every instinct they had as journalists to do so, uh, but they did it out of camaraderie. Um, and uh, I think it was the right decision. I stand by it. I think he's, he's here today in part because of it. You had conversations with Condoleezza Rice, I who did. was then still Secretary of State, at least yes. for the last few months that yep. he had been, uh, mm -hmm. after he'd been uh, uh, captured. Mm -hmm. um, and then also Richard Holbrook, who, yes. uh, yep. as we speak right now, is not in very good yes, shape. He, exactly. He's very ill, actually. But, um, and I understand he was uh, helpful to Oh, he, more than anyone in government, you know, he really tried to help us. Um, he was the special envoy to Afghanistan and Pakistan at the time, at, at January, in the middle of our case, actually. And... Uh, he spoke to Pakistani officials. There was a sense that the ISI, the Pakistani Intelligence Agency, um, perhaps had some level of control over the network holding him, the Haqqani network. And so he went to them and said, you know, please pressure them to release David on humanitarian grounds. If they won't do that, keep them talking to the family. Um, he actually made, made it possible for our family to meet with Pakistani officials in D.C. Um, to plead the same case. And it's not quite clear if the Pakistanis did nothing 
or if they tried but simply didn't have influence over this group? Others that had been through this experience mm -hmm. uh, that had been captured. Mm -hmm. Jerry Van Dyke, you mentioned, uh, yes, we talked yes. earlier, who had told his story. Mm -hmm. uh, the wife of Danny Pearl, yes. you know, who yeah. was, was killed. Mm -hmm. um, you, did you reach out to them or did they reach out to you? Uh, both. You know, um, some of them had contacted the newspaper and in turn contacted me. They asked the paper if it was okay to approach me. Um, I met with Jerry early on in David's case, I think at week one. I just, the uncertainty was the worst thing and I wanted to know what was in the realm of possibility in terms of how he'd be treated. Um, and Jerry was fantastic. He was very brave to tell me his story. He also advised me to keep it quiet. Uh, Marianne talked to me and said she felt... Danny based, Pearl's wife. Yes, right. Danny Pearl's wife, based on the fact that there were demands for David early on, 25 million and 15 prisoners from Guantanamo. Mm. She felt that um, it would be different than Danny's case. And she actually told me, you know, whatever you do, you'll have tons of people giving you advice. Just follow your gut throughout. The, the publicity about this, at, at various points, they tried to get you to do uh, some type of a video mm -hmm. statement. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. How'd you handle that? Um, they, uh, at one point, talked about uh, they were trying to make the videos as gruesome mm -hmm. as possible, so they were planning on bringing a local prisoner that they had arrested and killing him in front of us. And that was their idea of making the video more effective. And I was always very afraid that they would kill uh, my two Afghan colleagues. In an earlier kidnapping of an Italian journalist, they had... Um, decapitated the Afghan driver as a way to increase the pressure. So I hated sort of saying all these things. They were very scripted, the videos, but I knew my family was strong, and if it would save a life, um, you know, it was worth doing it. So mm -hmm. I, I kind of said whatever they, mm -hmm. they wanted me to so say. So the others that were uh, kidnapped along with you, uh, one was uh, an Afghan journalist, the other was your driver. Yep. Uh, as all of this transpired, how did, what did the relationship, how did it change? Um, they were um, initially, I mean, it would go up and down, and, and um, we were all under tremendous strain, but they were under the most strain. They were under the biggest threat. And in the last couple months of the kidnapping, the driver um, started sort of cooperating more with our guards. I think he was very afraid he would be the first one killed. Um, we talked to him about escaping a couple times, myself and the Afghan journalist, and the driver told the guards. So when we eventually did make our escape, um, we didn't include the driver. It was a very difficult decision. Um, we did um, send a delegation from his tribe after our escape, and he was um, he basically made his way home about five weeks after we did. Um, he was able to flee, and he's, you know, all three of us have survived this, so we're very lucky. I don't blame him at all for what he did. I think he was simply playing along with the guards to try to survive. In the midst of this, it wasn't too long after mm -hmm. he had been kidnapped mm -hmm. that uh, you got a phone call from the Taliban, <laughs> actually did. at the start of the whole negotiation yes, yeah, process, yeah. and you learned that they're kind of cheap. They were. They would, they would call and they would always specify, you know, look at the number on your caller ID and call us back because our phone card doesn't have enough credit. So it was like adding insult to injury. Yeah. But it gave me a moment to sort of collect my thoughts, to calm myself. So it was actually a good thing. That they and you've gone through a lot of training with the FBI I and have. how you would handle all yep. of this, trying Try to keep to them on the line call. all these things. Exactly. Exactly. So let's, let's move forward here. I mean, we know this is a long ordeal. Weeks mm -hmm. turn into mm -hmm. months. Mm -hmm. um, but let's talk about the escape, which is the rope part of the title. Yes. Um, we, uh, um, our captors at that point, they'd started out at 25 million and their demands had, and, and 15 prisoners, mm -hmm. and they had come down to 8 million and four prisoners, which was just, you know, delusional. The, the American government... Oh, what a heck of a way to, to, to negotiate. If you do ever do a house, you've got to think about this, huh? Yeah. yeah. The, um, I mean, people may not believe it, and they didn't believe it, but the American government does not pay <coughs> ransoms for kidnapped victims. They will not trade prisoners. Um, and one of the problems we've seen mm -hmm. is that um, other governments do. Mm -hmm. um, there are some European governments that reportedly do pay ransoms. So my kidnappers didn't believe that. And we were finally moved to a house that was very close to the, there was a Pakistani military base in this town where I was being held in Pakistan. The Pakistani soldiers sort of never came off of it. So we decided to basically, um, at night while our guards were asleep, um, we snuck out of the room where they were sleeping. Um, I had found a car tow rope on a shelf in this house when we moved in. It had been used by these fighters before us. Um, and there were sleeping bags and other things all over the place. We lowered ourselves down a wall with that rope. Uh, walked to this Pakistani military base. Uh, we were nearly shot by the guards there. They thought that I was a suicide bomber along with my colleague. I had a beard down to about here and, and local clothes on. And um, we finally they had us lay down on the ground, and then we took our shirts off to show we weren't wearing suicide vests. And they finally let us in. 
And this young, and I'll, I'll never forget him, very brave uh, Pakistani army captain, welcomed me on the base, apologized to us about what had happened, and he gave me this book called, you know, The Glorious Islam, and it was a much more moderate interpretation of his faith, and he sort of was very critical of the Taliban, saying they had really distorted Islam. And he then, most importantly, I was still afraid another officer might hand us back to the Taliban, and he then let me call home. Um, I called New York, and the, the joke is that my mother-in-law answered the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and then Kristen she, sort of took over. Yeah, I was a couple blocks away. What did she out. say to you, by the way, when, when your oh, mother-in-law yes. answered the phone? I apologized. I mean, she said she was yeah. stunned, first of all, that I was calling, and I said, we've escaped, and <laughs> here's, you know, and, and it was really important because we're on this, I'm with this young captain, with this unit of the Pakistani mm -hmm. army on this base in this town, and the tri it was very complicated. Mm -hmm. She got it all exactly right. Mm -hmm. um, and I apologized to her for what everybody had gone through, and she said, just come home safe. Yeah. And you, you were aware. Just <laughs> I was a couple blocks away. We live in New York City. Um, she called me on the cell phone. I ran home. When I got home, she had written all the details on sticky notes, so they were strewn across the wow. living room sofa. Um, I contacted um, the uh, the foreign editor at the New York Times and the lawyer who'd been working with us. They came over to the apartment, and between the four of us, we were able to contact um, Secretary Clinton. We contacted Richard Holbrook, um, Ann Patterson, who was the U.S. ambassador in Pakistan, and uh, they in turn contacted Pakistani officials and said, we know that David Rode is on this base in the middle of Miran Shah. Make sure he gets out alive. So, This whole ordeal, and in writing this book, um, mm -hmm. it's not just detailing the story, but you had other intentions, mm -hmm. other people that have uh, become victims. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And it's not just them, it's their families. Uh, exactly. You talk about aid workers. Uh, there was an aid worker just here in the Puget Sound region from Tacoma. Her name was uh, Sid Mazel. Mm -hmm. Tell me that story. She uh, worked with women in southern Afghanistan in the city of Kandahar and did great work with them. And she was kidnapped in uh, January 2008 with her driver. And it was this extraordinary thing. Um, southern Afghanistan is very, very um, conservative, and women rarely emerge in public. Hundreds of Afghan women who had worked with um, her gathered together and they protested um, and demanded her release. This had never happened before in Kandahar. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't enough. Um, it's believed that she and her driver were killed um, a few weeks after her kidnapping. Um, her body's never been recovered. We've been in touch with her sister and her family. Um, they're from the Tacoma area. And it's really luck. You know, she didn't survive. Danny Pearl didn't survive. Mm -hmm. It's who grabs you. And I happened to be grabbed by, you know, men who were very interested in ransom and prisoners and trying to make a name for themselves. And it's just tragic um, that, you know, her life was lost. And we just want to talk to her about her in this region because it's amazing what she did. And, and kidnapping, I mean, it's not just happening in that part of the world. I mean, it's happening throughout Latin America, mm -hmm. Central America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's exactly. become a business. Yes. And, you know, it's you learn business. that. And, yeah. it's, it's, and it's a lot of local people. I mean, there's a tremendous problem for Mexican journalists now. Mm -hmm. um, they face kidnapping in Pakistan, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and, and wealthy local businessmen. Mm -hmm. So we get a lot of attention, you know, yeah. because it was a foreigner. But the real big problem and the real numbers are, are local people who are being abducted and their families are, you know, extorted. Short amount of time that we have left, uh, where are we now in Afghanistan? And Pakistan, parts of that, that country really are uh, controlled by Taliban and Al-Qaeda, and we have no way of making any difference. Well, I, I, the, that's correct in that the place where I was held captive remains this sort of Taliban mini-state where they can plan attacks. Uh, Faisal Shahzad, the young man who tried to set up a bomb in Times Square, um, he got trained right where I was held captive. Nothing has changed. We are giving the Pakistani military, it's now $2 billion a year in aid. And a lot of experts think that we should threaten behind the scenes to cut that aid if they don't get more serious about eliminating these sanctuaries. And I think if the U.S. strategy um, doesn't shift, you know, there's a troop surge, the, the increased American troop levels won't matter as long as the Taliban have this sanctuary where they can essentially hide and kind of wait out. The U.S. troop surge, corruption in the Karzai government is a problem. And India is doing a lot to kind of meddle in Afghanistan, and that's why Pakistan backs the Taliban. They kind of see the Taliban as a proxy force they can use to kind of back, I'm sorry, to prevent India from encroaching so it's those three areas. We can make a difference 
um, you know, we just, there has to be a change in strategy. That's what most experts think. Mm -hmm. And from your mm -hmm. end of this, uh, going through this experience, mm -hmm. um, I guess, how did it uh, change you, affect you? Uh -huh. um, well, I learned the importance of family. You know, I had a crash course in getting to know my in-laws. Mm, yeah, right. <laughs> and thankfully, quickly. you know, they, very quickly, um, David's mom and dad said, you know, you're his new wife. We trust you to make decisions. I think it's a testament to their strength that they, that they allowed me to do that. Um, as I said, it was very close to my brother-in-law now and my own, my own family, my mother, my father sacrificed hours of time with my mom. Um, but I also learned, you know, resiliency um, and the strength of the human spirit to just kind of want to survive and, and, and celebrate each moment. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I guess that and the sense that things can go horribly wrong and, and perhaps get better. And, and I hope the book resonates with people, anyone dealing with a situation beyond their control, whether it's illness or separation from a spouse. You know, I, I hope that it's, it's helpful to them. So did you uh, write in blood that you'll never... Go in a situation like this, I, that, 30 <laughs> seconds into the kidnapping, I decided, you know, my days as a war correspondent are over. Yeah. I'm a, you know, I remain committed to journalism, but I'm not going to be returning to conflict zones. Well, the book is called A Rope and a Prayer, A Kidnapping from Two Sides, and it does tell that story from both sides. David Rode and Kristen Mulvihill, thank you very much for your thank time. You. I'm glad thank you made so it back much. safe and sound, and I hope others that might be in the situation are as fortunate as you are. Mm -hmm. right. Thank, thank you, you both. You. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you.